Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad you guys are here today, the second uh, Monday in Black History Month in February. My name is Philippa Duke, and I am the Director of Music here at Edenton Street United Methodist Church. And I am so glad to welcome you to this um, live event where we get to honor some of the artists and some of the theologians and authors um, that make up uh, so much of our history. So uh, today we're going to be honoring Harry T. Burley, who is a composer, arranger, singer, um, who was a really important um, figure in, in developing American um, art music. So. Um, I just want to start with saying a little bit of a small connection I have with um, Harry T. Burley. Um, Harry was born in Erie, Pennsylvania. And before I moved back to North Carolina, I'm from North Carolina, I had the pleasure of living in Erie um, for a few years. And I served at St. Paul's um, Cathedral in Erie. And that is one of the churches where Harry, uh, Harry T. Burley grew up, where he learned to sing as a young child. And so um, that church and that community has a really strong connection to his life and his work. And I knew a little bit, I've done a few, um, you know, a few of his pieces in choir, uh, but before moving to Erie, but while there, I really got to experience his music and learn about his life and his legacy and um, work with the, the choir there and a company for um, a CD of some of um, the spirituals that Harry uh, T. Burley wrote and that the, that choir recorded as a way to honor him. So I hope you'll um, really enjoy learning a little bit more about this amazing composer and the rich heritage of music that um, he has left us. Uh, so I have a few slides to go along with um, my uh, a few slides to go along with my presentation, just so you can see um, what Harry looks like uh, and some of pictures from the time. And hopefully you all can see that. Um, so this is Harry T. Burley. This is a picture of him later on in life. Um, but uh, his name is Henry Thacker Burley Jr., Harry. And he was born in 1866 and died in 1949. You can tell he had a really long life and an amazingly long career. Um, and you probably, um, if you know his name, you're, you know his name from his arrangements of spirituals. Uh, we've done several of them at Edenton Street. There are some for choir, for solo voice, and he's an incredibly important figure in um, taking these spirituals, which were passed down orally, and getting them, um, writing them down and making concert arrangements. And so that meant that a wider um, audience of classical musicians could perform them, and a wider audience um, could hear these songs. Um, and he was also very important um, to help develop the genre of the American art song. Um, he, he was a big figure in helping um, create art songs. Um, and then he was also very influential with the Czech composer Antonin Dvorak, um, who you may have heard of his name, um, of working with him to help create an American sound. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means and how he um, did that later. But here's Harry T. right now. Um, and uh, Harry... Um, T. Burley was born in Erie, Pennsylvania, as I mentioned, um, in 1866. And just so you know a little bit about his background, his grandfather, Hamilton Waters, um, was a slave in Maryland. And uh, he was granted manumission by um, earning uh, $50 for his freedom and um, $5 for his mother. So he paid $55, um, was granted manumission, um, in 1832. And so eventually he and his mother uh, ended up settling in um, Ithaca and then eventually moving to Erie, Pennsylvania. And so um, Harry's mother, Elizabeth Waters, was um, was born in New York and moved to Erie as a baby. And that's where Harry was born. Um, Harry's mother was a musician in her own right. She attended Avery College and she was trained as a teacher as well. Um, she was not allowed to teach in Erie County public schools. So uh, she taught in the Erie County Colored Schools and she also made ends meet by working as a housekeeper. So um, 
it was a very, very musical family. His first musical experiences were singing in his family's quartet. So that's how Harry learned to sing. And when um, Harry was interviewed later, he always said his mother was his first music teacher. Um, I've given a few uh, piano lessons to my daughter and they have been interesting. So I think kudos to them for, for making it work there. Um, and Harry, Harry's father was a very important figure as well. Henry Thack Thacker Burley, senior um, was a very important figure because he was um, the first black juror in Erie County. So a uh, very important figure there. Um, Harry's father died when he was very young and his mother remarried. Uh, so his, his relationship with his grandfather uh, was very important. And um, I've got in these slides here, this next slide shows a picture of um, Harry T. Burley as a young child. And um, you can also see this picture right here of Harry um, at the age of two with Harold Walters, who was her, his um, grandfather, and then Reginald, his, um, <clears throat> his brother, who was four there. So um, at this point, um, Harry uh, learned a lot from um, Harold. And uh, he heard him singing. It was well known that he was a great singer. He had an exceptionally melodious voice. And so he taught these spirituals and these slave songs to both Harry and Reginald. Um, so he really grew up hearing this music um, from the source. It wasn't written down, he just heard it. And um, Harry worked a variety of odd jobs in Erie to, to make ends meet as, as musicians and folks tend to do. He was, um, he lit, lit, lit the gas street lamps and he was a coachman. He worked on the Erie steamboat. Um, he even sang at the Erie steamboat later. Um, and he even studied to be an accountant, like all good musicians. We consider being an accountant probably, you know, every month. So um, he, he was really, really um, immersed in some musical culture from the beginning. His mother, as a housekeeper, secured a position for him as a doorman. Um, there was at a woman's house in Erie. And so she hosted um, musicals, which were basically uh, like mini home concerts. And so Harry was not allowed to um, be in the concert at the time, um, but he was allowed to serve as a doorman. And so he really experienced um, some of the best uh, classical musicians that would come into her home um, and uh, be uh, making concerts. So you got to hear that. Um, he also studied music privately and studied voice privately and sang in um, many, many local, uh, many, many local choirs. Got a picture right here on this next slide um, of Harry as a chorister in Erie. And he is right in the very, very top right, the very back row. It looks like as a teenager, a young man there. Um, and he sang in uh, so many churches in Erie. He sang at St. Paul's, um, Park Presbyterian Church and the Reformed Jewish Temple. And if you're wondering how could he do this, the services were staggered. And so he was able to go from one church to the next and the temple services being on Saturday. Um, and he was able to sing in all of these choirs and he really honed his skills as a musician. By the time he graduated high school, he was uh, one of the premier classical musicians in Erie, really risen um, the ranks in Erie. Um, by the time he was 26, he gained admission into the National Conservatory of Music in New York. And uh, this conservatory is defunct now. Um, in the 50s, it uh, has stopped um, going in, in business, but it was very important then. And um, Antonin Dvorak, the famous Czech composer, was the director of it at that time. And um, it was really, uh, it was a very great place to be because um, once Burley gained admission. He moved to New York City. He was immersed in that classical music culture, and um, he really distinguished himself as a soloist and as a composer. Um, he developed a really close relationship with Dvorak. The there's a story. It could be a pro, pro, um, it could just be a story. But uh, the the way they met was that um, Harry was working as a handyman making. Um, ends meet during college and he was singing some of these spirituals that he grew up uh, hearing from his grandfather. Uh, Dvorak heard him and wanted to hear these spirituals um, and they really influenced each other. Dvorak really encouraged Harry to 
dig into this genre of spirituals and compose and arrange them for a wider audience because a wider um, audience of mainly white um, classical musician listeners didn't know this material. And so this was a very big way that Harry um, was helping to spread this music to a wider audience. Um, there's a the quote, I have two quotes. Um, Burley has said that, um, he says, quote, I sang our Negro spirituals for him very often. And before he, being Dvorak, he wrote his own themes, he filled himself with the spirit of the old spirituals. And in turn, Dvorak has said, in the Negro melodies of America, I discover all that is needed for a great and noble school of music, end quote. So um, these uh, these two men were greatly influenced by each other and Dvorak remained um, a very big um, supporter of Harry T. Burley. Um, particularly if you know anything about Dvorak, you know one of his symphonies from the New World is an attempt um, for a composer from Europe to kind of develop an American sound. And so he drew heavily from these um, spirituals and from this music that um, Harry shared with him. Um, Harry also had a wide career after going to school. He stayed in New York um, as a church musician. And um, in 1894, he auditioned and received the position of soloist at St. George's Episcopal Church in New York City. And this was an incredible uh, position and honor. And um, here's a slide right now of St. George's um, Choir in New York. Um, you can see Harry T. Burley is on the front row all the way um, on the right corner. I think maybe it's right on your screen. Um, in the corner, he's holding a hymnal right there. Um, you know, this was a contentious move at the time. Several parishioners uh, really opposed his appointment because at this time in history, um, New York Episcopal churches did not allow um, black people into uh, worship. And so um, it was opposed by several people. Um, and in fact, J.P. Morgan, uh, yes, that J.P. Morgan um, was uh, on the board that cast the deciding vote to hire um, Burley. And so Burley um, became the first uh, black uh, person to hold the um, position of soloist at St. George's. And um, his relationship with St. George's was incredibly long-lived and fruitful. He worked um, as a soloist at this church for 52 years. Um, he only retired in 1942. And um, the claim to fame is that he only missed one uh, performance at where he was supposed to be, which is an amazing claim to fame. Um, and in addition, he started the tradition of hosting a concert of spirituals um, in May, which is a tradition that this church still honors today. So he really was um, instrumental in bringing these spirituals and slave songs to um, larger, predominantly white audiences. He also, during this time, um, for over 25 years, was a member of the choir at Temple Emmanuel, which he was also the only Black singer um, to be in that choir and serve as soloist as well in New York City. Um, but eventually, as um, as time went on, um, Harry became known in his time as an amazing soloist. He uh, was a worldwide traveler and sang concerts all over um, and made several European tours. In fact, he even sang for King Edward VII in 1908 um, on one of his European tours. Uh, he was a baritone, had a, a gorgeous baritone voice. And uh, when he traveled, he would sing concerts with opera pieces. Um, he would sing art songs, which are just um, classical music songs. And he would also um, sing arrangements that he made of these spirituals, these concert arrangements of these spirituals for solo voice and piano. Um, and so this was one of the, the first times these audiences were um, getting exposed to this music. And also it, he was exposing classical musicians to this music um, and writing them in a classical music form that would be widely um, performed. His music became so popular that it was said that you could not go to a recital without hearing a piece from uh, Harry T. Burley at some point in it. Um, and so um, Harry 
you know, really disliked being recorded. There were only two recording sessions that were ever made um, of him singing, and one has not been able to be found. But we do have um, one recording um, from 1919 um, of him singing Go Down Moses. Um, he hated the way he sounded on recordings. That is the only recording that um, has ever been found of Harry T. Burley singing, and that is from 1919, so um, kind of midlife recording of uh, Harry T. Burley. Um, and you can hear um, the piano sounds really tinny and thin, so um, the recording equipment is just obviously not what it is now. So you can kind of imagine how he might have heard a recording of him and then uh, compared that with how he sang uh, in real life, but you can kind of see that that definitely, um, you know, he didn't like it, and so he just refused to be recorded. And um, that particular recording I just played for you was by um, the George W. Broom Company, and that was the first African American um, recording company. So um, that company was the one that recorded him. Um, so just um, in thinking about his output of, of music, he really, really wrote um, hundreds of spirituals. So as we're thinking about this, um, I want you to think about if you have any um, spirituals that you love, that you know, that you have even just have heard of, and you can put those in the comment box, which is over to the side, because if you can think of one, I am pretty sure Harry T. Burley has made a solo arrangement of that spiritual. So as I'm talking about this next little bit, think about, um, think about some spirituals you might know and put it in that comment box. Um, here's a, here's a picture of Harry T. Burley a little bit later. Um, and so in terms of composition, um, Harry not only was a wonderful performer, but he started to publish these arrangements. As he was going on tour, people were hearing these arrangements that he was singing, and the demand was so high that he began to publish them. Um, as I mentioned before, he has written 200 to 300 um, art songs, is what the estimate is. Some of them were spirituals, a lot of them were spirituals, but he also wrote art songs um, grouped in cycles. Um, a cycle is just a group of songs that you might pair together to be uh, to be sung together. He also wrote newly composed um, pieces. Many of his um, original tune pieces are um, no longer in print, but a lot of his spirituals are, and they're still being sung. And he also wrote, um, because he had grown up singing in choir and singing in choir his entire life, he wrote 
um, spirituals requires. And so this was bringing this con this idea of the concert spiritual to um, mainly white choirs who were able to start um, learning this music, singing this music, um, and listening to this music. Um, he also wrote one hymn in the United Methodist Hymnal. We've got um, that one hymn is in there. It's the tune name is called McKee, um, or the, the words are, In Christ There Is No East or West. So um, in addition to those um, choral pieces and in addition to the art songs, he wrote, he wrote us a hymn too. Um, probably his most, um, his most, um, famous, I would say his most famous, uh, spiritual is Deep River. He's written a gorgeous arrangement of that. Um, I've been in the storm so long. We heard go down Moses. Yes. There's a, sometimes I feel like a motherless child that Pam has just said that there's an arrangement of that, um, steal away. Um, is another arrangement. So almost every uh, spiritual you can think of, Harry T. Burley made a gorgeous arrangement for voice and piano um, for. Um, in addition to his composition, he um, was an editor. He worked for um, Ricordi, which is an Italian publishing company. And he was also a founding member of the ASCAP, which is a composer's um, association that helps with copyright issues and, and getting um, money to composers because a lot of times uh, music was was distributed and in no, no way of paying the person who composed the piece was in existence until that point. And he eventually was on the board of that as well. So that was a big part of his life too and his career. Um, so it's really interesting when we think about Harry T. Burley, his legacy now is um, as a champion, as an educator, um, as a composer of spirituals, where at the time um, during his life, his legacy was definitely that of a concert musician. Um, and so he was very much... Um, in the concert music uh, scene at the time in New York, and he spent a lot of time supporting other black uh, composers and artists. So um, two that you may have heard of are Paul Robison and uh, Marian Anderson. He served as voc vocal coaches for them and was really invested in making their, um, helping their careers um, and amplifying their voices. So he, um, he really served as a mentor as well. Um, he died in 1949 at the age of 89 um, of heart failure, and his remains were sent back to Erie, Pennsylvania. He uh, was buried in Erie um, Cemetery, and um, he, his funeral, though, was held at St. George's, that church he was at for 52 years, um, and there were over 2,000 mourners there. So that just shows the um, kind of the far reaching impact of him as a musician and as a um, educator. Um, so uh, the Harry T. Burley Society, um, which was established in 2017, is a, is a society that really um, is a recent, uh, recently started to promote the performance of Harry Burley's uh, music and to um, also support other people who um, you know mentor them as as Harry did. So um, I just have a little bit to read from their um, their uh, mission statement, and they say that um, by circulating the ever expanding Black Art Music Archive, we invigorate the study of Burley, his contemporaries, and the generations that follow. The society consciously shapes arenas where interracial, creative, interreligious, and intergenerational encounters thrive, all fortified by beauty, seriousness, and compensation that follow Burley's model and raise awareness about the broad swath of his impact. Um, so right here, what we've got is a picture of uh, Burley from around 1900. Uh, as a as a relatively um, young younger man um, here, and this society is a really neat resource. Their webpage is um, BurleySociety.com, but they have artists that are making recordings. They have a scholarship by a variety of different scholars. Gene Snyder, who is um, 
one of the scholars who writes a lot about Burley. Um, in their performances, they honor um, the Harry T. Burley has a, a Saint Day in the Episcopal Church, September 11th. Um, so there are concerts and ways to honor um, his music and his commitment to teaching people about spirituals, to preserving these melodies, um, and really creating an American art form, which is the art song. Um, Harry's music is um, really beautiful. And so it's it's really still widely performed. Um, recently, uh, Susan Smith in our choir sang a version of Balm and Gilead that you might have heard at one of the sanctuary services. Um, the, the chancel choir has sung a really gorgeous arrangement of um, My Lord, What a Morning. And we've got a solo version of that um, coming a little bit later in Lent for you all to hear. Um, but we just really want to um, think about this man, his, his legacy, and what a fabulous composer it is, and listen to just the beautiful music that he made. Uh, when you first came on, there was a singer, um, Deshaun Bolton, who was singing uh, a cycle of some of his pieces. And the piece you heard when you were most likely jumping on was, uh, were you there when they crucified my Lord? So this music is still being performed in concert halls and in churches um, today. So, um, Thank you so much uh, for all that, for being here. Um, do you all have any uh, questions? Um, I can see some some of your comments um, in the side here. Um, someone has said, my soul's been anchored in the Lord. I don't know about that one, Liz Wilson. I will, I will check about that one. That's a good one. Um, so yeah, yeah, I will check about that one. Does anybody have any other questions about uh, Harry T. Burley? Um, and if I don't know, I'll look it up and get back to you. Okay, not seeing any. Well, thank you so much for being here um, and giving up your lunch hour to spend a little time with me learning about um, Harry T. Burley. Keep your eye out because you will hear his music and you will see his music um, and it, it will not be forgotten. So thank you so much for being here. Have a great day.